Hey guys, welcome back. Thanks for your patience with me. I know it's been a while since I've posted. To say I've been busy is an understatement. But we just got our Musician's Edition flute back from a shop. Speaking of the shop, I have to tell you this journey. So with the Musician's Edition student flute in white copper, right? Uh, I really wanted to get a text perspective. Not only that, I needed to figure out if your flute needed repairs, would they would would they even look at this flute? <laughs> and that has been a journey within itself trying to figure that out, right? So there were some places I knew right off the bat to admit, which was like, you know, Flutistry, the Flute Center of New York, uh, big, big flute places, you know, they work with name brand, big name brand only. I knew that going in. So I was just like, all right, I gotta find somewhere, maybe, maybe someone else who's local. So I call this one guy and, you know, I'm just, I just explain what I'm doing. I'm trying to, you know, I have this flute made from a flute maker and I just wanted to get a text perspective on quality. And if this flute shows up in your shop, would you work on it, right? No big problem. And the first shop I called blows up on me about how it's people like me who are destroying his life and his business. A little hard to hear and especially because like that's not what I'm trying to do and I'm not trying to sell instruments just to make money that's never my goal my goal really is I see a problem that people want to learn an instrument the flute right and it's too expensive so they don't get to do it right or they're ordering the Amazon flutes which are cheap and garbagey most of them not all of them most of them are cheapy and garbagey and I need something in between those because either way whoever's wanting to learn flute isn't learning flute I see a problem here right that's my goal it's not ever to just rip people off make easy money no 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 that's never it so anyway <laughs> I was just really caught off guard because normally you're like thinking it's either a yes or a no question yes we'll take a look at it no we only work on name brand things so it really caught me off guard and kind of like I don't want to say I'm soft, but you know, my feelings do kind of easily get hurt, but not to the point where I let it stop me from doing anything. Sometimes you just got to feel it out. And so I was like, oh man, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. You know, you got to think it all through like, but not nah, like when I played this flute, it was not like the flutes from Amazon. It didn't feel like them at all. It was so much more responsive and it felt great and it sounded great. Like there's no way my flute is the same as that. And so I needed to keep trucking on through. So I decided, well, maybe I should just look more towards uh, general band repair shops. Maybe that's it instead of like, even though that guy was too, he's a general band. So I decided to expand the search outside of my local area. So I just went down Google's line. And if you had an email, because I wasn't gonna call anybody after that. <laughs> if you had an email and you had a repair shop, I was hitting you up. You know, and so I just, in the email stated, you know, the first thing I asked before I even went into the spiel of what I'm doing is, do you work on all instrument or all flutes? Cause I, I did say flute. Do you work on all flutes or do you only work on name brand flutes? And I emailed maybe 30 people, 30 shops roughly. And some of them did come back with, we only work on name brand flutes. Uh, we don't work on anything off brand, blah, blah, blah. Fine you know, I already know then you're not gonna look at my flute. So those who said, we'll look at any any, any instrument, uh, there was one, I, the, whoever responded to me first, I guess, who said, we work on any flute, no matter the brand. So they actually were here in, in Florida, not, not in Tampa though, they were elsewhere. And so I told them what I was doing. I said, hey, I am working with this flute maker to try to get this own brand of flute I would love to get an insider, you know, a tech repair person's opinion. Um, you know, fully take it out, whatever you need to do. I want to know your opinion on this flute. If you think it's a good quality flute and if this flute happens to come into your shop, is it worth looking at? Is it worth fixing? What are your thoughts? They took it up. Uh, I had to pay them, which is, you know, not a big deal because I needed to know what the true condition of my flute is. So we have a six page report here and I thought it would be interesting for us to go over this together, especially if you've been following along and kind of saw 
how I felt about the flute and how impressed I was as a player with it. Let's see what the repair guy had to say about it. All right, so the first thing he listed was um, the flute itself and the things uh, that it was with. So his general characteristics, uh, plateau flute range from low C, offset G, which this flute is. Uh, it includes one straight head joint, appears to be brand new, obvious defects in finish or appearance. I sent him my tester flute. So this is the flute that I very first got before even ordering them. This was the very first flute. Uh, which means it's not brand spanking new, but it's new enough. <laughs> I, I mean, I did test it, I did play it, I did do a couple course videos with it. I do keep them nice and clean. That also means that uh, since this was my tester flute, I didn't have serial numbers or anything on it. Uh, I didn't wanna go through all of that when it was only the tester flute. That's what I sent him though. Um, let's see, brand is consistent to the instrument in case. Oh, once again, it's my tester flute, you should, <laughs> you should see this, this case because I had to test print things on it. So when I got the case, it had nothing on it. It was just a blank case, right? Uh, because the flute maker's job is not, was not necessarily to put my branding, anything outside of the flute. I mean, my, my logo is on the barrel, but it's not on the case. So let me open this up and let me show you how bad this case looks because I was testing out some ironing stuff. Hold on. Okay, no, it actually looks cleaner than uh, what I remember. I think the bad case is over there. <laughs> so I have it just here on this side, right? Now it looks pretty fine, but I have like some practice. I don't know how if you can see that. There's like some wear practice ironing marks. I think it's, yeah, I think the bad case is over here. Oh yeah, this I thought I sent this case <laughs> where I had like all my practice iron-ons. <laughs> this is definitely a practice practice case. It's funny because the company on uh, for these iron things, I know I'm getting off topic, but they said you cannot burn the, you can't burn the iron on thing, but you can burn your fabric. <laughs> that was definitely a lie. I've, my first several ones, I burnt the, I burnt the iron on thing. Not the fabric though. I burnt the iron on thing. Anywho, okay. So saying that if the, the brand matches, so when you do purchase this flute, it doesn't have the practice here, but it does have the logo here on the outside. All right, and then let's see, case is sturdy and holds the flute appropriately. Um, I sent this flute out to a, uh, what do you call it? An influencer, I guess that's what you would call them. And she actually had some complaints about the case. And um, I mean, it holds holds the flute. She did mention that, I think it was the head joint that's a little loose. If you shake it, I don't know how you can hear this. You can hear a little bit of rattling. Let's see, was it the head joint? Ah, that one is too. So, all right, taking a closer look at this. Let me try showing you here. The head joint in this case is actually a little bit loose. You see that? And the body actually has some space to move to. So she is right in this retrospect that I need to figure out something with this case to make the flute more secure or find a whole new case. So um, that's the next thing on my agenda to do. Because I like the case, but with her, like like she said too, it's not as secure as it could be. So something I have to consider. Okay, moving on. But he thought it fit the flute appropriately. I guess, because I've had a couple flutes come in where the case is so tight, it's pushing like the the back keys, and I felt like that was worse than like what this is. But whatever, what do I know? Okay. Uh, the case cover is also sturdy and holds the case appropriately. That's the outside and that is fine. Plastic cleaning rod is functional. It just comes with the standard plastic cleaning rod, nothing fancy. Playability. Plays easily through the full range. Although, see note about low C below with a pleasant tone quality. So he did think this had a good tone quality. And that's what I had felt too. No unexpected anomalies concerning pitch, response, or tone, which is also good because some of the flutes I got from Amazon, like that red one, that red one was weird with tone. Like, you know how we have half steps and whole steps? It had like semi half steps in between some of them or too much. It was definitely not half and whole steps on that flute. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see, all alternative and trill fingerings work as expected. High E is well compensated by the split E mechanism 
Intonation is acceptable. Pulling out approximately a fourth of an inch, I was able to play with a decent overall scale at A442. In a cold environment, when you would push in, you still, and still tune to A442. So that means, if, when you're, you know how we tune our flutes? I don't know if anybody's flute is fully in tune, pushed in all the way. So he's saying it's not pushed in all the way to be tuned, it comes out, and yet there's still space to move it out or in, depending on the environment. So it has the space to be appropriately tuned. Uh, let's see, pulling out more allows for A440, which will accommodate most uh, ensembles and most variations in player skill embouchure airstream. Spring tension is even and comfortable, and I felt that too. I think that's part of the responsiveness. Key work is erogenously friendly. Um, not sure exactly what he means there, but well, I'll take it. <laughs> All right, now we're getting into the nitty, the nitty gritty, and we even have some pictures attached. All right, so looking at the mechanical examination, pads, springs, and bumper materials appear to be an accept it be of acceptable quality. Good. That's what we want to hear. I know also with these, uh, some of the flutes from Amazon, the pads were a huge concern. Um, but he says what it's made out of is decent. It's good. Head cork appears to be natural cork and the crown and carrier work correctly. Excellent. I don't have any problems there. The notch of the cleaning rod was not aligned with the center of the embouchure hole. All right. So a lot of us have learned the markings on the end of the cleaning rod, you know, when you put it in through the embouchure hole, usually the line sits right in the middle. He's saying ours did not. It goes in a bit further than left on that location. This has the effect of lowering the high octaves. This may be an intentional design feature. Often I set up older flutes this way to lower third octave slightly. In this case, I was able to play in tune comfortably. So even though the lines didn't hit directly in the middle of the embouchure. He's saying it's still fine. There's other flutes that are designed that way too. All right, now he's saying low C was not playable just using the roller. I had to use both the C sharp and the C. I took the liberty of making the adjustment. Now, with that, as far as I'm concerned and what I believe, I could, you know, I mean, not everybody, but most people, when they play their low C, they're normally not only hitting this key, they're normally hitting both. So when you hit, he's saying when you hit both, you can then get the low C, but if you were only playing this, you're not gonna hit it. And usually what that means, or from what I learned from the flute repair class, is when they don't hit together, you just need to bend the keys a little bit. Don't try this at home, folks, <laughs> unless you've already done this before. But you just need to make these keys more even. So then that way, when you hit it, these keys come down at the same time. That's that's all. So that's like a real minor adjustment. And I don't, and especially as a new player, that's not really going to make much of a difference to you. All right, carrying on. <clears throat> all other aspects of regulation were excellent except that the A key height was slightly higher than others, causing some lost motion before actual, uh, actuating the B flat pad. I took the liberty of making the adjustment. So my flute, it sounds like, should come back in a little better condition. But once again, these are all things that someone who's just learning, it's not gonna really affect. So when he's talking about the, um, what do you say? Lost motion. That just means, okay, once again, we're coming down to like, Keys coming down at the same time, you know, like keys, they come down at the same time, right? And so what he's talking about is like lost motion would mean when you're hitting a key, it will like, one key comes down and then you would feel the other key engage and then they would like come down and they may not land together at the same time. So in order of to fix that, you know, you'd have to make it to where the key comes down just a little bit. So when you push them down, they're both engaged at the same time. When I first played this, to be honest, I didn't feel or even hear that there was any form of lost motion. Uh, other flutes I have played, not brand new flutes, uh, but more of like the flutes that I purchased to work on, I'll sometimes I will feel that there's lost motion. 
you know, I can feel my key coming down before it engages the other key. I didn't on this one. So I don't think, you know, if you were to buy this flute brand new and you were a new player, you wouldn't even really know or feel it. And it did seal any time I played. I had no problems with things sealing and making noise or sound. All right, key fit is excellent throughout. No loose bearing surfaces, no binding key work, no excessive key noise. And that was something I was impressed to. I don't know if you guys remember, or if you're new here, uh, when I played the purple flute on the wall, uh, though it played, it played, it was very clunky and you could hear the keys anytime you're hitting them. This one did not work that way. In fact, it was more quiet than my Bundy. And I know, the Bundy is a cheap flute, but whatever. <laughs> it was still, at one point, a name brand flute and uh, most of the shops will take your Bundy. All right, so uh, let's see. Here's, here's a big thing he stated though. I attempted to remove a knock pin using traditional methods and was not successful. With more force and more extreme measures, I could have eventually gotten it out, but I have no desire to scratch or otherwise damage a brand new instrument to perform an unnecessary procedure. Speaking of the, um, the knock pin still, the tops of the knock pins are smooth and should not injure the player or otherwise get caught. All right, so the knock, the knock pins, this is something that um, more of techs would know. All right, so the pins, let's see, I gotta find where the pins are in here. Okay, so a pen is a spot that kind of like connects the keys to the rod. I don't know how well you can see that. There's a pen right here. It just barely sticks out. It's right here, okay? And so a lot of times if your flute's gunked up or like really gunked up more than most other flutes or if it's rusted or just really stubborn and your keys are not functioning properly, you would then take that, that pin out um, and then the key is free from the rod. Okay, um, so he's saying if you're having any issues with that, he doesn't know how it would really react because he couldn't get it out easily and didn't want to, you know, force it on a flute that was working. Um, even though I've only been working on flutes for a very short time here, I only had one flute that we needed to take the pins out. And uh, I had to take that one in because I didn't know how to do it, nor did I have the tools. I still don't have the tools for it. Um, I don't know how common it is to need the knot pin removed, replaced. I don't know where that lies. Um, within that, but it's something to keep in mind, I guess, for myself or e even my the students. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I know it's important, but I don't know if it'll make or break the flute. Um, I think he, t I, I kind of skimmed over this a little bit before, and I think he made a mention towards the end. Anyway, we'll keep going on. Removing the foot joint, or removing the foot keys, I'm sorry, and wiping the rod and hinge tubes revealed some dirt embedded in oil. Observe the ends of the pipe cleaners and the towels. This is more likely a byproduct of plating or the assembly process. Uh, and many instruments uh, from many different makers have this issue. So this is nothing uncommon. And he did put a little picture in here. All right, um, it just shows the pipe cleaners, which if you followed some of my other, I think we had the pipe cleaners. You usually use white pipe cleaners and when you put them in, if it comes out really dirty, it shows how dirty your inside mechanisms are. So he's just saying they're dirty. And that usually is just, uh, you know, to be honest, it, this flute is made in a factory. And so sometimes parts are just kind of sitting out and that's probably why it's like that. But also, like you said, this is, this happens with a lot of other flute makers. This isn't going to make or break it. Uh, let's see. Okay. The roll, the key roller on the low C operates smoothly. And that just means how well it actually rolls. Tenons fit easily and secure, that's good. The, the green flute, which is another Amazon flute, the flute tenon is not tight, it falls right off. And that was right out of the box. <laughs> All right, pads and tone holes. One of the pads, upper G, was sticky for unknown reasons. I cleaned the surface of the pad and it is improved. That might just be because I've been playing it. I don't know, I don't recall it being sticky. I don't recall any of them being sticky, but 
th that's not too bad of a fix. It's a minor thing. <clears throat> Probably just clean that up a little bit with some uh, pad paper. All right, let's see. Pads are installed with a single hole paper shim only and clamped heavily to form the seat. And he's got a picture here. Now pads are out of my wheelhouse for, no I have some knowledge of pads, but not, you know, I've, I've only did my one attempt on repairing pad, putting new pads in and I, I failed. <laughs> I did not learn pads at the flute repair class. We only did COA stuff. All right, let's see. It is very likely that the pads were not checked after the initial shim due to no witness marks drawn on the pad to ensure they go back the same orientation. I did mark the two pads I inspected out of necessity. So what that means is I've never actually like taken things fully apart. We did talk a little bit about marking the pads when we were in the COA class. So what that means is when you take a pad out, right? The flute sits a certain way. So the pads also kind of like the more you use it, they get indented in certain ways. So like, for example, the pad on this end would more likely have more of an indentation than here on the end, just because this is where we're pushing, which means there's more pressure on this. And over time, there's gonna be, you know, more pressure here, barely any pressure here, which means if you happen to have leaks, it might be on this end versus this end. So when you take the pad out, you wanna make sure that this end still goes on this end when you put the shims in or whatever you're doing to make sure that's not even, to make sure it remains even. If you put this in the opposite way, and then put a shim here, well, then you're gonna have a leak down here. He's just saying, uh, oh, and when you, they normally mark it, they usually just take a Sharpie and put a little dot, and the little dot will go where the arm of the key is. And then that way, when they're putting it back in, they know where it goes. And when the next repair guy looks at it, he still knows where everything is aligned and where it goes. He's saying there's no marks on it, they didn't take the time and put those dots in. That's all he's saying. All right, so let's see. Uh, pad impressions are not even. There are visible low and high spots, which could be avoided by using partial shims to le level the pad. The pads were not ironed prior to the leveling seating. Pad life will likely suffer as a result of these conditions. It would be possible to improve this somewhat by adjusting and removing whole shims to just the overall thickness, as well as uh, tweaking the key cup left or right to make sure the sides of the pad sit, to make sure the pad seat more even, or he had a typo in here, sit more even. Uh, and then he had a picture here, though it was hard to just tell with just the picture, it just looks like a pad to me. <laughs> so with that, that is not the best of news. Um, I do remember, you know, doing some of the pad stuff, uh, you know, I had ironed it out and that was just to get some of the wrinkles out and to make things sit better. She's saying that that was skipped. Um, if things sealed very good though, so I'm not sure. I don't know, it's just something I'll have to keep in mind is that that step was skipped. Um, might have just been skipped to keep prices low. Once again, those are things to just keep in mind. I don't, I don't know. All right, moving on. Pad washers and screws function correctly. That's good news. <laughs> um, there are visible defects in the tone hole surfaces. These should have been addressed before attempting to install the pads and unlike partial shims, require relatively little time to correct and would not be uh, appreciable, uh, would not impact the cost of the flute. The defect is approximately eight o'clock in the left photo and seven o'clock in the right photo. When they talk about clocks, uh, when you're looking at the tone holes and cups, you wanna look at it just as a clock and they do that to know where things are. So he's saying, uh, you know, if this is the clock, you look at like an old fashioned analog clock, figure out where eight is, it's here, that's where the problem is. Um, and I mean, he sent pictures, the pictures are really hard to see though. Um, so that might just have to be something, that's probably why the pads seem uneven is because the tone holes are uneven. All right, next he checked for the leak check, and that's using the light to see how the pads are actually sealing. Okay, uh, using a magnahelic calibrated to an open end reading of eight, I observed the following. All right, this is, yeah, way out of my knowledge of flute repair stuff, but head zero, body 2.7, foot 0 0.4. Um, I guess if you are a repair person, because I had a lot of you guys comment on my uh, flute repair stuff, 
So if you want to help us out and let us know in the comments what that means and what is appropriate and what you should look for and, and all that jazz, I'd love to hear. But he sent some pictures on that too. There's him like using the machine and just showing it. I don't know what any of that means or what I'm looking at there, so I don't know. Uh, let's see, then he said, these values easily pass for an entry-level flute and are better than expected considering the method of the pad installation. Um, he said, but I predict the flute will gradually leak more as the felt underneath the clamp pad seats reverts to its original shape. So I guess it's good for now, unknown how long it'll last. Things I have to consider, I don't know what other flutes brand new are like in that sense or how they compare. Um, so I don't know. Once again, things I have to consider or speak to my maker about. All right, recommendations, suggestions. Excellent. No serial number was found on the instrument. As a former band director of someone who managed several inventories of rental stock, I often advise that instruments with serial numbers are much easier to index and track. Issues involving theft are also resolved more easily easily with identifiable serial numbers. Like I said, I sent him the, um, my test flute. This is, this one does not have a serial number, but the inventory that we have does have serial numbers. This was just my tester flute. I wasn't gonna have him put a serial number if the flute was garbage and I didn't go with him, you know? So that that's why, the rest do. Um, all right, witness marks where the head and body meet can be beneficial for less experienced players. players and have no downside to the playability of the instrument. Three or five lines engraved piece, one line on the other. Older Armstrong flutes provide the textbook example for this, but there are, uh, um, but there are others. Uh, yes, so what he's saying on that, there's actually a lot of beginner flutes that don't have this feature too. And he's right, it wouldn't really cost much more. So I don't have a flute like that on hand right now. I just sold it. The, um, the Artley flutes were really good with that. And what that meant was on the barrel, this is how the Artley flutes were, and I have most experience with those ones in them. They would have little dash lines engraved in them. And then the head joint on the end would have dash lines on them as well. And so you could find the dash lines and you can match the dash lines and know that your head joint is in the foot body straight. That would avoid from you having to do this. That's all he's suggestion, uh, suggesting. So a lot of flutes don't have them, so it's not a, you know, he's just saying for a beginner flute, might be helpful. Okay, let's see, what else? You are marketing this flute to beginner flutists on budget. Considering offering a curved head case for the smaller flute players, if your supplier can accommodate. It's like he's reading my business plan. That's the next flute that's coming out. It's not gonna be the whole flute within a straight and head or curved head joint. It's going to be the, uh, the flute with the curved head joint with the D body is what we're gonna do uh, instead. So that will be coming out and hopefully coming out soon. Uh, I'm about to order that test flute here soon. All right, so that's coming up. All right, next, the knock pin issue should be considered. I'm not sure where your flute is made but we have encountered this problem a lot lately. If any of the pen sections rust or gets bent, taken apart would be very costly, uh, likely more than the cost of the instrument. I think there are two better alternatives, screws instead of pens, uh, like oboes, or penless construction like some of the pearl flutes have. These both would involve some redesign of the keywork, but very few flute makers are doing either of those. Some flute makers keep sets of replacement pen section on hand for technicians. All right. So we could think about that. My flute maker is open to any changes that we need. So um, I might talk to him about having the penless, uh, the penless design and see if they're able to do that. And we don't even have to worry about it. But definitely things to consider. All right, conclusion. While this report is not intended to convey any form of an formal endorsement, I believe this flute is beyond acceptable for a first instrument. I found no disqualifying issues. If a student had shown up to one of my first year band classes or private studio with this instrument I examined, I would be relieved. That is a relief to me, <laughs> especially after reading the things about like the tone holes, the pads, the, the, the key, or not the keys, the pens. You know, I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you know, but 
um, to hear that, you know, this is a decent flute still, you know, he would be glad to see a student with this flute. That, that is very much a relief. All right, the area with the greatest potential for improvement is the quality of pad installation. Uh, granted, this flute is at a price where nobody is installing pads the right way because it's too costly, but honestly, by the time the first pads no longer seal well enough, it's probably time for the student for, to upgrade to a step-up flute anyway. So that's actually really good too. Um, because like this, this flute is, you know, I don't want to say it's not intended for to be a forever flute because when someone buys an instrument, that's kind of what they're thinking. But I definitely am trying to offer the flute that is more cost effective. I mean, budget friendly more of, uh, I'm looking more for the budget friendly flute that can get you started nice and strong that you can feel confident with at least to start. You know, if, if the repairs are too much, five years, 10 years down the line, I mean, yeah, you might as well then upgrade your flute at that point, but it is enough to at least get a student started and falling in love with the instrument and with music. Unlike the too expensive flutes where you can't even get started or the really cheap flutes on Amazon where you feel like you can't go anywhere. This one, it sounds like you definitely can learn on it and it should last you a decent amount of time. I would, my guess would be, you know, he says he's thinking it would last until you need your step up flute. So to me, that's good news. I'm still gonna talk to my maker about the pen lists and what we could do about these other things. Uh, I have 10 in stock that are just like this, uh, just like this one. So it's not, you know, my whole entire inventory. It's just, I only have 10, I started off small. That's the plan, start small, grow bigger. Uh, later we are gonna get the, the kids' flutes with the curved head. That'll be helpful too, because I don't know if you've seen those flutes. Those are very expensive too. And if I were a kid, a young kid who wanted to play flute, and that's what the price of it was, my parents would've been like, huh, no, 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 no. Even though there are other options like the, the Nouveau Toot and stuff. But, you know, point being, there needs to be a happy medium between price and quality, and I feel like overall I've found that. So I'm very happy, and now I actually have a list of people who will, will take a look at this flute if it needs repaired. So I have a list now of people who will and will not look at this flute, and now I know the quality of this flute inside and out and what I can talk to my flute maker about. So this is all great. Moving forward. Yes. So. Thanks for joining me here and listening to uh, the findings of the Musician's Edition flute. <laughs> and uh, if you know about any of the stuff that our repair guy had talked about that I wasn't really sure of, I'd love to hear your thoughts or what things mean or what the importance is of these things. Let me know down in the comments. I'd love to hear. And even though I, I may not have the time to respond, I am reading them and I am very grateful for any advice or happy thoughts, any of that kind of stuff. I'm very grateful for it. I'm grateful for you. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time. <laughs>